Good evening, Resident Evil fanatics. It's getting dark out there. I hope you've made it inside safely. I am here, once again, to share with you some more thoughts, theories, and insights on Resident Evil Village. Last time, we investigated the origins of Mia's folktale, imagery of ritual sacrifice, and several connections to Bram Stoker's Dracula. Tonight, we will be exploring more Romanian folklore, creatures, and mythology, and how they inspire what we have witnessed in the Resident Evil 8 trailer. It is to my great delight to tell you, I came across some things so peculiar, so strange, and yet so amusing in the making of this video. Such things not only elevate my earlier theories to new heights, but actually escalate the plot elements of this upcoming Resident Evil title. And of course, legends and folklore play a critical role as is expected, given how much we were able to deduce already. I also want to draw your attention to some key details regarding the Wesker Project and Spencer's dream of ushering in a utopia through artificial selection. These details are more relevant now than ever, even more so than the secret file videos from Revelations 2 on my channel. Now, brace yourself, as this one's going to get scary. The Romanian Wolf a classic, timeless icon of Romania's vast forests and mountains since the early ages, a symbol of night and winter, of darkness and danger, a harbinger of death. As home to almost 15% of all of the wolves in Europe, Romania has one of the largest and densest wolf populations in the entire world. In early Romania, as well as in many other early European civilizations, wolves were deemed fickle and bloodthirsty, inspiring an ever-growing library of folklore regarding the fear of wolves, transformation from man to wolf, and producing wolf children. Such folklore holds an especially prestigious place in Romanian folklore, and in fact, their legends actually predate that of vampires by hundreds of years. In order to actually understand the behavior of the werewolf, we need to go back to the original roots of both monsters, as they both represent undead spirits that seek fresh blood of the unfortunate. Enter two classic Romanian evils, the Strigoi and the Pricolici. In our last folklore analysis, we deduced just how strongly Resident Evil Village is inspired by Bram Stoker's Dracula. The Strigoi actually serves as much of the original inspiration for several vampire adaptations, namely Transylvanian superstitions by the Scottish author Emily Gerard. Gerard studied Transylvanian folklore for a few years before releasing this, which then served as Bram Stoker's chief basis for constructing the archetypal vampire. While many simply equate the concept of a strigoi to a vampire, the original strigoi is actually first and foremost a spirit, namely a vengeful undead spirit that serves as a standard form, which then gains access to all forms of lycanthropy. This means that it may assume the body of a bat, snake, wolf, insect, or really whatever it deems appropriate to drain the vitality of its victims through blood loss. Beyond this massive selection of assumable forms, a strigoi can also shapeshift itself into human form, and such a concept gave birth to stories of undead strigoi starting their lives over as normal people. Many, many different life happenings can result in the creation of a strigoi, some of the most famous of which include being the seventh child of the same sex, dying by suicide, and most famously, having another strigoi feast on your blood. A female strigoi is known as strigoika and is often depicted as a witch, or more precisely, a sorcerer or conjurer. This witch-like depiction is very fitting for the women in the castle of the trailer, whether Capcom chooses to actually label them as such or not. These creatures are also said to bring storms, droughts, and paranormal disturbances that we associate with poltergeists. Given the enormous variety of depictions that can fit a strigoi, it is understandable that many vampire adaptations focus on just a couple pieces of the strigoi lore. The most recognizable tells of a strigoi are vampiric bites, often used to transform the victims into strigoi themselves, which is now a trademark of the classic vampire. Regarding the latest playtest leak from Biohazard Declassified, which, keep in mind, is still speculation at this point, the Strigoi in RE Village is depicted as a large bipedal goat that sucks the blood of its victims, which is an interesting form for it to take. 
Sheep and goats are often seen as holy symbols in Romanian folk tradition, which actually makes this portrayal even more disturbing, as it is essentially the corruption of a sacred animal. In fact, the ability of a traditional strigoi to shapeshift makes this even more frightening, as the goat or ram that we see in the trailer may actually just be a strigoi mimicking the behavior of a standard goat on all fours to avoid drawing attention. Given that this is Resident Evil, perhaps some new strain of virus turns a standard goat into a nightmarish bipedal strigoi with goat characteristics. A pricolici, then, is a special type of strigoi that always manifests itself as a large wolf, also with that same propensity for human blood. Pricolici, like many other types of werewolves, are often believed to be troubled spirits of violent men who died and arose with an insatiable lust for slaughtering humans and cattle. There are some contradictions regarding the lore of Bricolici, regarding just how human-like the wolf form truly was. In fact, there are multiple different types of werewolves that may also fit Capcom's adaptation in Resident Evil Village, which include the standard werewolf, the Lycan, and the Ruvanush. All of these resemble lycanthropic transformations into werewolf-type creatures, each with subtle distinguishing features. For example, a lichen is often portrayed with greater intelligence and strength of a werewolf, and may transform from man to werewolf spontaneously, rather than strictly on the night of a full moon. This creature is actually rather underexplored and underrepresented in books and films, with Underworld, Rise of the Lycans, as one of the few pioneers of lichen folklore. Since the Pricolici is the most wolf-like and least human-like in standard depictions, perhaps one of the other werewolf-type creatures is more fitting of this one in the trailer. If Pricolici do exist in Ari Village, I'd imagine they'd be a more wolf-like creature than the Beast Man that we see here. In this scene of the trailer, we can see what is likely the work of a hungry werewolf. Many legends of werewolves, Pricolici, and actually Strigoi as well, focus on the destruction of cattle and horses, and so the misfortune of a farmer meant the misfortune of an entire community. After all, how can you explain what you do not understand? You spin stories, and so it was not the drought that spoiled your harvest, it was the strigoi that conjured such a terrible happening. It was not the plague that killed your horses, it was that sneaky bricolici. As mentioned earlier, several other European countries would spin their own tales of werewolf folklore, one crucial tale that I have deliberately saved for this portion of today's exploration tells of a king who doubted the power of his divine god. But before we dive into this, it is important to understand the historical relevance of how werewolf superstitions sparked fear. In the early ages of the Roman Catholic Church, more stories spread of all things sinister, including witches, werewolves, and things that were associated with the unholy Satan. These things that didn't align with the priest's motives were seen as a threat to the power of the church, and so the people were ordered to smite all those plagued by incorrigible sin. This burning was administered to punish all those who were not genuine Roman Catholic Christians, as the church held a fear of being overthrown by these heretics. And so, just as the churches demanded, death by fire was dealt to Protestants, Jews, Gypsies, mystics, witches, and of course, werewolves. Allow me to share with you the tale of the infamous King Lycaon. The Greek root of his name is tied to the term lycanthropy, a term for a severe delusion in which a person holds the conviction that they are an animal, usually a wolf. Such a delusion was actually diagnosed in several cases by the ancient Romans, and such a person may crave raw meat, prance around on all fours, and even howl just like a wolf. As people of the Middle Ages began to understand that such afflicted beings were not truly werewolves but insane individuals, they began to genuinely treat them rather than burning them at the stake. There were also instances of wolf-like behavior in otherwise sane, stable people, usually due to gypsies offering LSD-infused substances as treatments to common ailments. These often contained wolfsbane and poppy seed, which would spark vivid hallucinations. Moving back to King Lycaon, this man was so ruthless, so unforgiving, and quite the heretic, committing sins beyond the realm of God's forgiveness. But of course, a king does as a king pleases. His cruelty was so horrid that Jupiter, the head of the gods, decided to enter his kingdom. Lycaon invited the god in for a royal feast, but he highly doubted the god's legitimacy. So the foolish king, impious as he was, prepared a meal mixed with human remains to test Jupiter. But of course, a god's perception does not falter. 
Infuriated, Jupiter turned the king into a wolf, essentially obliging his liking towards human flesh. The implications of this are beyond what I had ever imagined. I hope you are ready. In our last deep dive on Romanian folklore, we examined the sides and the top of this gate mural. In a couple of my previous videos, I examined the significance of the main portion of the gate mural. Here is what my friend, Kat, and I found. The large beast that seems to be clutching a person and feasting on them is strongly reminiscent of the painting, Saturn Consuming His Son, by Spanish artist Francisco Goya. In the mythological context of this painting, Saturn is a Roman god who feared his children would overthrow him, and so he proceeded to consume each of his children. His children included Jupiter and Juno, who are brother and sister, respectively. Thus, the large beast must represent Saturn, and the being he is feasting on represents one of his children, perhaps Jupiter. There is also a woman with a lance on the left, who also seems to be depicted in the statue here. In both cases, she is poised to strike, armed with what seems to be a spear. This strongly resembles Juno, one of Saturn's daughters. And so, Saturn represents Spencer, Juno represents Alex, and the body being feasted on represents one of the Wesker children. Now, that body could be Jupiter, as he is Juno's brother, which would make the body represent Albert Wesker, unrelated brother of Alex Wesker. Let me explain. Since Oswald E. Spencer administered the Wesker Project in hope of creating utopia, he is the metaphorical father of the Wesker children, Albert and Alex Wesker. Spencer's obsession with an artificially created utopia had spread to Albert and Alex just the same, with Albert pursuing Ouroboros to kill those incompatible and essentially renew the human race. In fact, the very term Ouroboros means tail devouring, and the symbol is a serpent or dragon consuming its tail, representing the continuous cycle of life, death, and rebirth. Similarly, Alex administered T. Phobos to trigger in response to fear to single out the optimal candidate for her mind transfer into a younger, healthier body. The Greek word phobos literally means fear, and this is critically important because of Alex's obsession with Franz Kafka, the very chronicler of fear and despair. In fact, Alex Wesker quotes Kafka multiple times in Revelations 2, and even seems convinced that the story of Albert and herself parallels the story of Gregor and Greet in Franz Kafka's novella, The Metamorphosis. Therefore, Spencer would parallel the unforgiving father of Gregor in the book. If you want a more comprehensive analysis of all the parallels between this Kafka novel, The Wesker Children, and Spencer, I have a video on my channel just for that. So all three of them have a motive for artificial selection, and all of them are obsessed with immortality or godhood. Spencer is to blame for indoctrinating them with this worldview since young, so this can be seen as an image of Spencer feasting on Albert's sanity and freedom since his youth, as all Wesker children were stripped from their own families and their own dreams. But in the original folklore, Jupiter is actually the one responsible for the downfall of his father. His mother tricked Saturn into consuming a large stone instead of his body, and thus the children came tumbling from Saturn's mouth. In the darker Resident Evil version, Albert impaled his metaphorical father through the chest, stripping the last bit of life from him. And if somehow, Albert returns through cloning, or a similar transfer process, the Lycaon and Jupiter tale holds some very interesting insights. After all, in Resident Evil Umbrella Corpse, they even hired DC Douglas himself to play the voice of a nondescript elite in Umbrella's ranks, and this game was confirmed to be canon, and after the events of Albert's death in RE5. That was quite the performance, wouldn't you say? Guts and determination. Good show. This would mean that Albert Wesker may possibly be responsible for the werewolf type of B.O.W. we are seeing in R.E. Village, as Jupiter turning Lycaon into a wolfman may suggest. After all, it was Albert's HCF, or Hive Host Capture Force, and the Connections Crime Syndicate that developed the E-type virus in Resident Evil 7. This research led to the creation of the first E-type, Eveline, who was eventually neutralized by Blue Umbrella. It was Albert's work that is inevitably tied into one of the focal points of RE7, and RE Village is essentially a sequel to RE7. Despite his death in a volcano in RE5, his HCF unit and legacy proceeded to produce BOWs in RE7. Since this unit is still very relevant to the development of new bioweapons, 
It should also be noted that a T. Veronica sample is still in their possession as it remained within Steve Burnside's worn body at the end of RE Code Veronica and Albert confiscated that body. So it's entirely possible that Albert, living, dead, or undead, is in some sense responsible for the werewolf type monsters we are seeing, and his unit may have used the T. Veronica sample from Steve as a basis to form this. It also seems that these connections to Jupiter in connection with Spencer's philosophy aren't new to the Resident Evil series. In Resident Evil Remake, Spencer's reading room has a gramophone with a record in it, and the record's name is Jupiter. In that very same room, there actually seems to be a copy of another Franz Kafka book, The Castle. In the recent leaks from Biohazard Declassified's playtests, which again, may still be mere speculation, two leaked names are extremely relevant here. Olga, the woman in black who attacks with swarms of insects, and Pepe, the lady in more traditional, almost made like attire. Both of these two names are actually characters in the castle, and Pepe is in fact a short, rosy chambermaid type of character in the novel. How curious! It's like how Revelations 2 has Kafka written all over it, with Alex Wesker quoting Kafka and his drawings being collectibles. Ari Village may have a similar influence, and if Alex Wesker is truly in this game, her methods shall excite fear and despair once again, just as Kafka would prefer. How exciting just how endless these connections seem to be. Thank you once again for exploring them with me. So, do you believe Albert's HCF organization created some of the monsters in Ari Village? Do you believe Albert Wesker is still somehow alive? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this in-depth analysis video, feel free to check out my channel. The link is in the description. I post deep dives of Resident Evil lore. Until next time, try to survive in a cold, cruel, Carlosless world.